morning. You are the hardcore. You had so many reasons not to be here today. I just thinking about it this morning. It's time change Sunday. It's the first Sunday of Duval County spring break and the coronavirus. I mean, you had like so many reasons. You could have picked any one of them not to be here today, but we're glad you're here. And now we know, if you want to know who's hardcore around here, just look to your left and right in front of you, behind you, because this is the real deal. We're so glad you are here today. My name is Gary Weber. I'm the pastor. And whether you're joining us uh, here or whether you're not feeling well and you stayed home, we welcome you too. We're glad that you're joining us online or on the podcast. And uh, we are, we're super delighted to just continue the series that we started several weeks ago called Losing My Religion, Losing My Religion. And we're going to continue this for the next couple weeks, and I am going to need your help for the message on March 22nd. Uh, This has generated a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts, ideas, and so we are going to take March 22nd to have a sermon based around the questions and comments that come from you. So if you haven't already submitted a question or a thought, use your communication card, or you can email us or use social media to let us know, and uh, we'll take March 22nd to try to address some of those. And I thought what we would do this morning is just play a little Family Feud. Do you remember how Family Feud works you you've got a topic and then you've got to give up guess the the answer so today's topic is the top 10 things religious people don't do okay top 10 things religious people don't do this is what most people if you say hey if you're a religious person you wouldn't do this and it's kind of a small crowd home crowd today let's just have some audience participation name something religious people don't do Skydiving. I don't know about that. It's not on the list. Ant. Survey says ant. What else? Dance. Yes, dance. That's on the list. Ding, ding, ding. Now, listen, I don't know how you feel about dancing. I've seen some of you. You just shouldn't dance, okay? (laughs) It's not a religious thing. You just might throw a hip out, all right? So that's on the list. Dance. What else? Oh, go, go to party, drink. Okay, drinking's on here. I put an exception unless you're Episcopalian. Some of you might. If you were raised Episcopalian, you know what I mean by that. What else do we have on here? Any other ideas? Come on, just shout them out. Okay, gambling. Yeah, gambling. And if you're really super religious, you don't even play cards. Like, it's not okay to play cards at all. Anybody ever grow up hearing that? Like a church I went to, and uh, I found an old, like from the late 1800s, early 1900s of our church in Marietta, the, the minutes, and there was a person who had to sit on the sinner's bench because they were found playing cards the Friday night before. So, I mean, that's serious. Religious people do not play cards. What else do we don't, what else don't we do? Okay, don't go to movies. Anybody ever, yeah, you don't go, don't go to movies. Not just rated R movies, you don't go to any movie at all. What else? Another one. Yeah, okay, there it is. That's the one I was going for. If we disagree on anything else, movies, dancing, cards, all of that, the one thing we can all agree on is religious people don't cuss, right? We just don't, religious people should not cuss. So I, I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks, and, and I, I thought we should start this conversation out by talking about, well, what is cussing? What is profanity? I don't know if you've ever heard a thing or a message kind of focused around what is this, what is profanity? Um, really, if you think about it, I've got a visual illustration here for you. Um, this right here has a technical and scientific name, right? Right? Um, this morning, I got a text message from my wife that our dog was covered in something, and it wasn't good, right? So this is not what my dog was covered in because this is actually a smashed up Tootsie Roll. <laughs> but you were thinking something else, right? You were thinking something else. That has a name, doesn't it? Now it has a scientific name. And I, don't look at me like that. You all know what I'm talking about. You just can't believe I'm talking about it in church. And you're going to understand why here in a minute. But, but listen, it has a scientific name. And, and there are actually multiple scientific names. Um, you might call it excrement, might be a name you would use, or feces would be a technical name that you could use. There are lots of names that you can use. Um, if you've been to the doctor, you might have to leave a stool sample. We all know what they're talking about, right? They're not talking about something with three or four legs on it. I mean, you're, you're feeling uncomfortable, aren't you? This is good. This is what I'm going for. Now, here's what happens. So here's the way, here's the way profanity happens. So there are, there are things that we find offensive or disgusting or revolting. Now, most of the things are actually things we all participate in or have. Like, th- these are just things that we just don't talk about in public nice circles. And so we give them scientific names, but there are also sort of just accepted uh, vernacular words that we use to replace the scientific 
words. You know what, now your mind's going a lot of different places, a lot of different things. So there are, vernac- there are vernacular words. As we use the vernacular, some of those vernacular words become kind of, they're kind of innocent or funny, and then they become more and more crude. And then what happens is you take a crude word that refers to a real thing, and you apply it to something that, it, that is not that thing. And suddenly you have profanity. Now here's what's interesting about the history of profanity. You can go all the way back, as as far back as we can trace human language, there's always been profanity. We think, well, you know, it's never been, we go to movies today and we think, oh, it's so bad today that, you know, our society is just, 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 you know, uh, it's just spinning out of control, and that may be true, but the truth is profanity has always been a part of human language. Uh, you can trace it all the way back, uh, as far back as it goes. And the Bible actually addresses this. And many of you have been thinking about some of these verses as I've been talking this morning. And let me just share some of them with you. Psalm thirty-four, thirteen says, keep your tongue from evil. Now, that's not just talking about profanity, but certainly it's including profanity. Matthew 12, 36, Jesus said this, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. So again, the net is much broader than profanity, but certainly includes it. Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, a good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so people speaking like this, you think, well, that's a reflection of what's going on inside your, not Tootsie Roll, but something else. That's what's going on. James 126, we looked at this word a few weeks ago, but it replies to the way we use our, our tongues as well. He says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a, keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Uh, a couple more verses. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. But now you must put all them away, all, put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouths. Uh, Ephesians 4, 29. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only which is useful for building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. Ephesians 5, 4. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Now, given all those verses and the many, many more like them, you may think, well, why would we talk about this? What, what's the issue? And, and I, I want to just at, pose a question to you, knowing especially that the last three verses were written by an, the Apostle Paul. Is there anything that you could imagine that would make the man that the Holy Spirit used to write those very verses and many others like them use profanity? I mean, what would drive the Apostle Paul to cuss? Now, it's important to know about Paul's religious background. Paul was a religious zealot who became a radical, irreligious follower of Jesus. So he was somebody who had uh, been raised in the right home, taught all the right laws, probably had those Old Testament verses I read to you uh, memorized. And, And this guy was super religious. He had this incredible encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he was blinded by Jesus. And then he became this radical Jesus follower, planting churches all over. And he was writing to a church when he said this in Philippians 3, a familiar verse. If you've been in church any amount of time, Philippians 3, 8, you may have it memorized. But here's what he says, Philippians 3, 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. The Greek word is skubala. In order that I may gain Christ. Skubala. Scubula, that's the Greek word that Paul, that Paul chose to use. Now, as the Bible was being translated, uh, different people down through the ages have debated and argued about the word scubula. Um, you, if you're reading ESV, as I'm using today, uh, you might see it translated as rubbish, uh, garbage, uh, trash. Uh, and that is, a, that is a, a somewhat of an accurate translation. It it's not, doesn't quite capture what Paul was saying, though. The, the King James actually gets it a lot closer because the King James says, dung. I consider it all dung. Now you get where this is going. A lot of people who study this word in the history of the Greek language uh, actually say that Paul was using a word much stronger than dung to refer to this. In fact, Martin Luther, when he translated uh, the Bible into German, 
used a profane word in his translation of this passage to get the point across. Now, you think, what in the world would he have done? What would have made Paul use such strong word? And you think, well, if you think about Paul's life, if you think about what he did, how he participated in the persecution of the church, like he was going from town to town, rounding up Christians, persecuting them, demanding that they, that they deny their faith in Jesus Christ. If you think about it, maybe that's what he was talking about when he talks about it, because that's disgusting, that's filthy, that's vile. Surely Paul's talking about the way he persecuted Christians. Maybe, maybe Paul's talking about the way he actually participated in the murder of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. That he stood there and he held people's coats as they cast the stones and Stephen died in front of him. And as Paul is thinking about back to this and he thinks about knowing Christ and he says, all that, my participation in Stephen's murder, it's scubala. And absolutely that's that's right. Maybe there was some secret heinous sin that we don't even know about. And as Paul's writing this, he's thinking about that sin in comparison to knowing Jesus. And that would certainly be true. That's how we often interpret this verse. We often think about this verse and we think about our life and all the disgusting things in our life. And we think, compared to Jesus, it's all just scubula. It's garbage. It's rubbish. It's trash. It's excrement. And that is not a bad understanding it's not wrong our sin is like a pile of excrement it stinks we try to hide it we don't want people to know about it and and sometimes we go back to it over and over again and and maybe like our dog maybe we wallow around in it a little bit and that's what sin is like and absolutely it's disgusting but put in context it's important to know that is not what Paul is talking about That's not the comparison Paul is making at all. Look with me in your Bible, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, to get an understanding of what Paul is talking about. Now, Paul is writing to some young Gentile Christians in the city of Philippi. He started this church. Uh, It's been up and operating for a while. Uh, These people came to faith in, in Jesus Christ. They were not from a Jewish background. They were pagans. They were Greeks, uh, Romans, and they'd come to faith in Jesus. And as they're following Jesus and their church is doing well and they're serving people, there were a group of uh, Jewish Christians, uh, religious Jewish Christians from Jerusalem who had made their way into the city of Philippi. And they began to say, hey, yeah, Jesus, that's great. We're glad you know him. We know him too. But you don't know the whole story. Like if you are going to be righteous, there are some things you're going to have to do. Like, you're going to have to be circumcised, you're going to have to follow the festivals, you're going to have to keep all these dietary laws. You know, Paul did good to tell you about Jesus, but he didn't give you the whole story. So let us teach you how to incorporate all these religious activities into your faith in Jesus, because that's what's going to really make the difference in your spiritual walk. So Paul has heard about this, and he's writing back to these Christians. And here's what he said. Indeed, I count, I'm sorry, uh, Philippians uh, 3, 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now let's just talk about what he said right there because already Paul is using some pretty strong language and imagery. Now today, in certain circles, uh, a dog can actually be a positive term. You know, it can be a term of endearment. Uh, But they didn't think about dogs that way back then. Dogs were disgusting, vile animals. And so when Paul calls these religious people coming to town, he said, beware of those dogs. He's using a pretty strong language. He calls them mutilators of the flesh. These Jewish believers who were demanding that these Gentiles uh, practice the Jewish laws, particularly the uh, practice of circumcision, mutilators of the flesh. It was an ancient outward symbol that was supposed to symbolize an inward change if someone is set apart for God. A, a, a Jewish boy at eight years old was to be circumcised. If that didn't happen when he was eight and they were a proselyte, maybe a Gentile who'd come to believe in the one true God of Israel, uh, whatever age they were, they were to be circumcised at that age. And so these religious leaders are coming in saying, hey, you guys have to be circumcised. And Paul is saying, no, those are, they're dogs. They're mutilators of the flesh. Now, you think, well, this is just a radical new idea. But in fact, Paul knew what the prophet Jeremiah said about this, that this outward symbol of an inward change uh, was never supposed to be an end in and of itself. Jeremiah 4.4, this is what the prophet says, circumcise yourself to the Lord, circumcise your heart. 
So circumcision was supposed to be an outward expression of an inward change. In fact, if you go through the outward expression but don't have the inward change, it's pointless. It's worthless. It would be a little bit for us today uh, like baptism. You know, baptism is a beautiful outward expression of an inward change. Uh, on Ma- March 29th, we're going to have Baptism Sunday. Uh, we're going to do the beach baptism again this summer. And any time we get to celebrate baptism, you see somebody go through the waters of baptism as they're buried uh, in death with Christ and raised to walk in a new life. It's a beautiful picture. It's an outward symbol of an inward change. If, however, the inward change hasn't happened, they're just getting wet in front of a bunch of people. There's nothing magical about it. It doesn't mean anything apart from what it symbolizes, the inward change that's taking place. And Paul's saying the same thing is true of those who would tell you to be circumcised. He says in verse 3, for we are the circumcision. Now he's talking to Gentiles. They have not been circumcised. We are the circumcision. In other words, we are the outward expression of the change that happens as we placed our faith in Christ. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And here it comes. Here comes the thing that Paul is comparing to Scubala in verse 8. Listen to what he says in verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. (laughs) Paul says, you want to compare religious resumes? Okay, let's do this. Let's compare religious resumes. Because my religious pedigree is better than any of those religious dogs who are coming trying to mutilate your flesh. I have the right biology. I was born to the right people. You'll never be able to say that, you Gentiles, because you were not born to the right people. I have the right religious upbringing. I was raised by Jews. I was trained by Gamaliel. I had the right teaching, all the best teaching you could get. I had the right behaviors. I did all the right things. I kept the law. I was blameless. I had right actions. This was my religious resume. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, and I count them as scubala. My religious upbringing... My training at the feet of Gamaliel, my religious credentials, the tribe I was born in, scubala. Scubala, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God on the basis of faith. You can take all of my religion And it amounts to a pile of excrement compared to knowing Jesus Christ. It's worthless. It's trash. It's rubbish. It's scubala. Now, it's important when we get to this to understand the way the Bible uses comparisons. Because certainly Paul... Uh, is not saying that there is no value in those things. We know, in fact, that Paul continued to practice certain religious rituals and traditions even after he wrote this letter to the Philippians. He had uh, Timothy, one of his disciples, circumcised. He, when he went into Jerusalem, he actually paid for the religious ritual and routine of some young men who were with him. And he took them in the temple and he paid the, the temple tax to, for them to go through this ceremony. At one point, Paul shaves his head as a sign of a commitment or a vow that he's made. So we know that Paul didn't just abandon all the religious traditions, but what he's saying is in comparison to knowing Jesus, in comparison to knowing the power of his resurrection, in comparison to knowing his suffering and being associated with his suffering and attaining the resurrection from the dead myself, it's all scubala. Jesus used the same technique in Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Here's what he said. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. 
Like, well, wait a minute, Jesus. I mean, isn't this the same guy who said, you know, love your neighbor as yourself? Isn't this the same guy who said, love your enemies and pray for those who are persecuted? How can you say, I want you to, I want you to hate your mother and father and your spouse and your children? Because it's in comparison. The greatest love you have in your life, Jesus is saying, ought to be like hatred compared to your love for me. He said it another way in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, seek first uh, my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. It's an issue of priority. It's an issue of comparison. And Paul says, all that religious stuff, all my credentials are like scuba. And he goes on in verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, to share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or I've arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to win the goal and to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It's all scubala. It's all scubala in comparison. Now, I want to just share with you three things, and if you're a note taker, you might want to write this down or um, take some notes inside your worship guide, but I want to just share with you Paul's problem with religion, Paul's response to religion, and Paul's alternative to religion, okay? So, So Paul's problem, Paul's response, and Paul's alternative are all included in this passage. First of all, Paul's problem with religion is that it values ritual over relationship, That religion values ritual over relationship. This is why he was telling the people in Philippi, hey, don't listen to those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh. They do not care about you. They are simply trying to put another notch on their religious gun barrel. They don't really care about you. And religion sometimes does that. It values the ritual over the relationship that it signifies. The second thing that I think Paul had a problem with is that religion gives a false sense of security. A false sense of security, that somehow you go through the religious rituals and you think that's all that God wants from you. So you come to church and you say a magic prayer and you get dunked under some water and you think, well, I'm good. And you think you've been deceived, like you've got a false sense of security. If you think that's what God wanted for you, just to go through some rituals or routines or you go to communion, you you go to mass or you go to confession or you, you walk through the religious rituals and somehow something about you feels like, well, maybe I've checked the boxes and now I'm okay with God because I've done all these things. Some of the most haunting words that Jesus said are recorded in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and following when he said this, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out many demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. You Get away from me, you evildoers. Listen, if you are religious, that could be good. It could be beautiful. But that verse should keep you up at night. Not because you should be insecure in your salvation in Jesus, but if you are counting on religion, you can go through all the right religious rituals and routines of prophecy and teaching and healing and doing everything, wonderful, amazing works, and get to, be, to, get to Jesus only to hear him say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Why didn't Jesus know them because they were not seeking above all things to know him. They were depending on their religious rituals to do what religion religion is powerless to do. Paul's problem with religion, Paul's response to religion, you can see it pretty easily in the first part of this passage. First of all, those who promote religion over relationship with Jesus are dogs. Like it doesn't matter what credentials they have. If they are promoting religion over a relationship with Jesus, they are wasting their time and they're wasting your time. And the second thing is he says it's scubala compared to knowing Jesus. All of it is scubala compared to knowing Jesus Christ. This is not a new idea. When Paul used this term, I think Paul understood and was remembering what the prophet Isaiah had said. You remember back in Isaiah chapter 64, maybe you've heard this verse before, Isaiah said this, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Isaiah's not saying our sin is like filthy rags. Well, of course your sin is like filthy rags. 
Of course, rec- Paul recognizes that his persecution of the church and his uh, persecution, participation in the, in the murder of Stephen are scuba. Of course they are. But Paul's saying, my religious credentials are scuba. And Isaiah is saying, all my righteousness is filthy rags. And listen, the translators cleaned this up too. Because the, in the Hebrew, it's not filthy rag, it's used minstrel rag. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he's comparing. And again, he is not comparing sin. He's comparing acts of righteousness. And let me just ask you, can you clean up a counter that's dirty with a filthy rag? Of course not. And that's what he's saying. If you are trying to clean up the sin in your life with your own righteousness, it's like trying to clean up sin with a filthy rag. It's like saying, I've got sin in my life, let me rub a little scuba on it. If I'm just going to apply religion to it, it's just like putting scuba on the sin. It's just like cleaning a a sin-covered counter with a filthy rag. And Paul's alternative to religion is pretty simple. A lifelong, passionate pursuit of Jesus. He says, I've not attained it yet. And this is Paul. Like he's planted churches all around the world. He's about to be beheaded for Jesus. And he's saying, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on towards that goal. This is a lifelong calling. I am pursuing knowing Jesus with every breath I take, with every step I take, with everything I do. My goal is to know Jesus. That's my goal. That's where I'm going. That's the alternative to religion. So this week I was thinking about this and uh, just trying to come up with a way to maybe help us understand this a little better. And so as I was doing that, I was thinking about my own religious credentials. So I, I, my family of origin um, were not particularly religious people back generations ago, but somewhere back far ago there was a, uh, there were some folks who went through confirmation and seemed pretty committed to their faith. And so this was my great granddad's confirmation book, uh, well used. It's a, it's a, it's a treasure because it reminds me there is some religious heritage there. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. Um, there was, this certificate is my uh, ordination certificate. In fact, it was right here, February 16th, 1997. I was ordained right here in this church. That's precious. That's valuable to me. It means so much to me. This is, uh, this is my degree from Southwestern Seminary, Master of Divinity degree in biblical languages, no less. Like, I worked hard. Like, I had to learn Greek and Hebrew. It was a lot of work. This is really precious. So this is a ministerial robe. It, uh, you don't have cause to wear them in, in our tradition much anymore, but every now and then for a formal wedding, I'll get to wear a, a ministerial robe. But this one in particular means more to me than just that because um, this robe was actually Dr. Knight's robe. Um, he was pastor here for 27 years. And it was uh, Reverend Harrington's robe before him uh, who was a chaplain in World War II. And it was passed from Reverend Harrington to Dr. Knight. And before she passed, uh, Mrs. Knight um, gave this to me. Uh, beautiful, special, meaningful thing to me. This is my doctoral dissertation. If you want some good sleeping material, (laughs) I've got some extra copies. There are hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of thought and prayer and effort invested in this. It's all scuba compared to knowing Jesus. See, I could have gone through every bit of that I could have been ordained, I could have gotten a degree, I could have taken a job as a pastor at a church. None of that was going to wash away the sin in my heart and life, none of it, none of it. It might as well be like a filthy rag, like trying to clean up my life with a filthy rag. It's scuba compared to knowing Christ Jesus and being known by him. Listen, if you are here today, and you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, please listen to me carefully because it would be so easy to be 
to be misled into believing that somehow you can achieve salvation and peace with God by going through some religious ritual or by simply signing something, saying a certain prayer, going through a certain custom or tradition, being baptized. And I'm just going to tell you, it'll never work. It'll never work for you. And for others who are here, and maybe you've gone through all the religious traditions, and you have this false sense of security that somehow all the things you've done in your religious life are what are saving you, and you still can't get over the guilt, the shame, the brokenness. It's because your religious activity was never going to save you. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only thing that saves you. None of that can wash away your sins, but Jesus' blood shed on the cross for you can wash away your sins and make you whole. It is not about what you do, but it is about what he has done. So let me just ask you a few questions as we bring this to a close this morning. These are uh, also inside your bulletin, and you can maybe ponder them this week. Um, We'll put them on the screen as well. Let me just ask you this. Have you allowed religion to become a substitute for a passionate pursuit of Jesus? Now, I'm talking mainly to you who are involved in church a lot. If you're not involved in church a lot, you get a little pass on this question because that may not be your issue. But for those of us who go through the rituals and the routine every week, is this just a habit? Have you allowed it to become a a replacement or a substitute for passionately pursuing Jesus? Second, are you still running the race? Like you started it. Maybe you were passionate at the beginning. Are you still running the race race like, like Paul? Are you still pressing on to take hold of the prize which you find in Christ Jesus? Or have you climbed up in the stands and you're just watching the religious show that goes on? Have you reached the place where everything you value is scuba compared to your, your love for Jesus Christ? Like all the best things in your life? All your best activities, on your best day, your most righteous decision, your most godly decision, are you willing to say, it's scuba compared to knowing Jesus? Are you instead putting your faith in your own acts of righteousness? It will not save you. It is a filthy rag. It's a pile of scuba compared to knowing Jesus. So today I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. We're going to have a time of commitment as they make their way up to lead us in one final song. Um, and inside your worship guide, yes, that is, that is toilet paper. <laughs> it's double ply quilted. It's high quality. <laughs> we strive for excellence at Southside. Now, if you didn't get one, you can ask your neighbor if they can spare a square because there are two <laughs> pieces. But here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. If there is anything in your life right now righteousness or maybe sin, whatever it is that you would say you are depending on, relying on, putting your faith in, that you, you love it more than you desire to know Christ. I'm just going to ask you to either write down on that little piece of toilet paper what that is, initials, draw a picture, whatever it is. Maybe you would just in your heart and mind, you'd know what that is. Maybe you wouldn't write anything on it. But I'm going to invite you during this song to come up here And to put that piece of paper where it belongs in this bin of trash. I I thought about a different kind of receptacle this morning, but I figured I was already pushing the limit. (laughs) But, But just understand, that's where it belongs compared to knowing Jesus. And if you don't know him today, please don't leave here without finding faith and trust and wholeness and healing in Jesus. Do not depend on religion to do what for you, what only faith in Christ can do. Will you stand together as we pray and respond as God leads? Father, we come to you this morning and we are um, convicted about the ways that we have allowed so many other things to uh, take your place. Lord, that we pursue our own righteousness, our own good works, our own deeds. As, as if there's something that we could do to save ourselves and it's like filthy rags, it's like scuba. Lord, today would you just deliver us from that and help us to see that, Father, may everything we do be an expression of our love and our gratitude, not an effort to earn your favor. Lord, for those who are here and have never found peace with you because they've been trying to use religion to substitute for what only knowing Jesus could do, Lord, I pray that today, 
uh, those people would come to know you. Lord, help us turn our hearts toward you in this time of worship. Be glorified in your church as we just bring before this altar and leave in this box those things that have distracted us from knowing you more fully. For we pray it in Jesus' name.